Hi, and welcome to part two of our Lesson 7 video, Lessons for Novice Machinists. And this Lesson 7 is all about planning a sequence of operations. In part one of this lesson, uh, we looked at general notions uh, that will guide us through a proper planning process. And we looked at a very simple example. Now, remember that I mentioned that we're not going to get away with winging it when we're going to plan the sequence for a complex part. For that, we need to do paperwork. So guess what? We're going to do paperwork. But before we do that, if we want to follow the sequence that I proposed right at the beginning, well, the first thing to do is to get acquainted with the part. And that means to study the drawing of the part. And the part that we're going to use as an example in this video, well, is the hammer handle. Let's start by looking at the assembly drawing for three reasons. First reason, the assembly drawing permits us to identify the part that we want to produce. In this case, we're going to produce part number two. It also gives us a general overview of what this assembly looks like and where our part fits into it. And thirdly, and very importantly, it's on the assembly drawing that we find the bill of materials. And it's in that bill of materials that we're going to discover of what material this part needs to be made of. And it's also going to indicate to us what the overall minimum size of the blank part should be. The material called out for on the drawing is CRS, or if you prefer, cold rolled steel. Any cold rolled steel will do. But since this is the first project that my students worked on when I was teaching, I tended to choose a C12L14, which is a free machining steel, cold rolled, mild steel, that contains a lot of lead and that is easily cut. It's really nice to cut. It produces chips easily. And this tended to encourage the students at the start because nothing encourages a student more than success. We can also see that the overall minimal dimension of the blank part to be used here measures 19.5 millimeters in diameter. And that's an error. It's a little mistake I made because it should be 19.05 millimeters in diameter by 237 millimeters in length. I say that the 19.5 is a mistake because what we really want is 19.05. It's a lot easier to find because it's equivalent to a three quarter inch diameter bar stock of cold rolled steel. Now I'm going to leave this mistake on the print because we do have a tolerance of plus or minus 0.5 millimeters on the dimensions that sport just one number after the decimal point. And that means that 19.5 falls within the tolerance of the 19.05 that I'm looking for. And yes, I can still use that three quarter inch bar of cold rolled steel that's easy to find and remain in the tolerance of this project. So that's all the information I need from this print. Let's now take a look at the detailed drawing. Here we want to start by identifying the part that we need to make because this detailed drawing contains several parts. And we saw on our assembly drawing that we're looking for part two. And here's the identification balloon for part two. For those who have some experience in machining, well, please bear with me. I'm going to go through this step by step. And I know that this is not mind blowing information for many of you. But remember, this is a machine shop course for beginners. Now that we've identified the part, we want to look for drawing notes. And we can see here that four notes apply to this part. So let's head over and read those notes. Note A indicates that we have two grooves to produce, two grooves that are three millimeters wide by 16.5 millimeters in diameter. Note B indicates that we have three grooves to produce. And these are thread clearance grooves. And these grooves measure 
three millimeters wide by eight millimeters in diameter. But hang on just a minute. There's only one groove on the hammer handle. Why are they talking about three? Well, note B also pertains or relates to the hammer head, which has two threads, thus the three places. Note D provides information concerning the knurling on the handle. And finally, note E provides us with information concerning the pre-drilling operation of the 12 millimeter hole, and also information on the depth of the reaming required for this hole, since these dimensions do not appear on the print. Now we can get back to our part, take a good hard look at its dimensions and the tolerances of each one of those dimensions, as well as taking a good look at its shape. Now that we're acquainted with the part, we can start to think about operations. I mean, we have a good idea of how this part is going to be produced. It's going to be produced on a lathe because once we've studied the part, well, it's obvious that it needs to be turned. It's a cylindrical shape. But knowing that it's going to be produced on the lathe doesn't tell us what operations need to be performed. And for that, we're going to want to produce a temporary, at least temporary, a list of operations in no particular order. And for that, we're going to go from one end of the part to the other and just rhyme out all the operations that we have to perform to produce that part. We're not looking for an order of operations here, just a list of all the different operations. So, from left to right, I can see that we have a surfacing operation, a center drilling operation with a number three center drill. We're going to have to turn uh, a diameter to 9.8 millimeters, and we're going to have to produce a lead-in chamfer for a thread. We have a threading operation, M10 by 1.5, and at the end of the thread we have a thread clearance groove to produce, and that's a 3 millimeter wide groove. We then have a form tool uh, cut groove, a groove that has a radius of 4.7 millimeters. Then we come up to a taper turning operation, a knurling operation, a drilling operation, uh, we're going to be drilling 11.5 millimeters in diameter. And if I look at the end of the part, since I'm in the drilling sequence, we might as well say that we have to ream that hole to 12 millimeters. Uh, we have a countersink to produce and two grooves that are three millimeter wide on the knurl. And at the very end, well, we have a surfacing operation, and I'm going to add a center drill number four operation. It's not on the print, but I know I'm going to have to produce one to perform the knurling. Well, if I've done my work well, what do I end up with? Well, I end up with this list of operations, operations that appear in no specific order. And why is that list so important? Well, there's two reasons. First, that list will become a checkoff list. Now, I'm not talking about Anton Chekhov here, the uh, Russian physician, playwright, and author. No, I'm talking about a list that you can check off items from. And why would we want a checkoff list? Well, when we produce a little soon, uh, the uh, sequence of operations uh, sheets, well, we're going to want to verify that we didn't forget any operations. And since when I produce the sequence of operations, uh, I'm going to be bouncing around the part from one end to the other, it's easy to forget something. So this list that was produced from one end to the other of the part in no specific order, just the order that the operations appeared to on the drawing, well, that list, if I've done it well, is going to be complete. So when I've done the sequence of operations, I get my checklist out and I check each operation off to ensure that they do appear in my sequence of operations. Now, the second reason that this initial list is good to have is that it can help you produce a tool list. Now, you're going to say, fine, my sequence of operations will also give me a tool list. Great stuff, but it gives you a tool list after you've completed the sequence of operations. And if there is 
a tool that you require that you don't have or can't access and that you don't want to buy, well, you may have to alter your approach. And that means that you might going to have to change your sequence of operations that you've just produced. Now, if you do your tool list right away with this initial list of operations, well, you can then alter your sequence of operations if something doesn't work. And a good example, there is a 12 millimeter diameter hole to produce on the end of the hammer handle. And it's quite accurate. So it has to be reamed. Actually, it's reamed 20 millimeters deep. Well, that's all great and fine, but if you don't own a 12 millimeter diameter reamer and you don't want to go buy one, well, you may choose to produce that hole by boring with a boring tool on the lathe. It's quite possible to do it that way. But if you do, boring on a lathe, especially a very accurate hole when you're just starting out in machine shop, well, that's pretty terminal. It's risque. So you may want to position that risque operation a little earlier on in the production of your part, and that'll change the whole sequence of things. So really producing a tool list before you figure out your final a sequence of operations is really a good thing. So this temporary or initial list of operations is pretty important to do. And if you work in a shop that has a tool crib and a crib keeper, well, a good tool list will really simplify life for you and will make you more efficient because you can go over to the crib, hand your list to the crib keeper and let the crib keeper gather up all your tools in one foul swoop. This will make you a lot more productive because you're not back and forth all the time to the crib. And it will keep you on the crib keeper's good side. And believe you me, you want to be on the good side of the crib keeper because that person can make your life really miserable. It's a bit like the receptionist. And I used to tell my students all the time, uh, close to graduation, that if they're looking for full-time work, the most important person in the company is the receptionist because if that person doesn't find you agreeable well that is as far as you're going to get in that company and regardless of all that uh, it's, it's always better to be polite organized and efficient than to be a prick now that we have a list of all the operations that i need uh, to perform to produce the part, well now is the time that I have to put them in some kind of order. And that is really the complex part of planning a sequence of operations. But it doesn't have to start out complicated because the first thing you have to do, your first decision, and this is all about making decisions, well your first decision is where do I start uh, on this part? What do I cut first? Uh, on the part on the lathe, we usually start at an end because, as I've mentioned before, you want to establish reference surfaces early on in the fabrication of a part. And this part is going to have two ends. One end that has a uh, knurling on it and one end that has a threaded end for the hammer head. I'm going to suggest that we start with the threaded end. Why? because this is the most complex of the both ends and it's the one that I risk screwing up the most and if we want to follow the logic that we laid out in our first part of this video well we want to perform all the terminal operations as soon as possible in the fabrication of the part so we're going to start with the threaded end of the part and this really brings up something that is important Everything you do, every operation you perform, should be in a specific sequence. It's part of a specific sequence. And there is a reason why it is done there. It should never happen that you perform an operation just because it's the next thing on the drawing that you saw. So let's take a look at what the first end that we're going to perform, the threaded end of the handle, what that would look like on a proper sequence of operations sheet. 
And here's a simplified version of what a sequence of operation sheets should look like for work in a home shop. Now, it's simplified because obviously in the home shop, we don't work on incredibly large projects with several, several parts being produced all at the same time. So, this simplified version, if we look up at the top, we can see that there is a header. And that header contains general type information, such as project, uh, part number for that project, the quantity of that part that needs to be produced, uh, the, the person who prepared the sheet, as well as the material required. Now, now that I'm looking at this, I realize that the prepared by could have been done away with. That really exists because sometimes the person that prepares the sequence of operation isn't the person that produces the part. But in the home shop, that's not going to be the case. So you can just do away with it unless you have existential uh, issues. And in that case, well, it might be good to write down your name. Then we have four columns, and if we move over to the left here, we can see that the first column is used to produce sketches. And the sketch column sports a, a dotted grid that will help you to keep your sketches nice and true. The next column is for operations. Now, this is where you're going to describe the activity that you're going to perform on the part uh, in that specific operation. The next column has to do with tooling, and it's here that you're going to write down which cutting tools will be required for the previously mentioned operation. Now, usually it is limited to cutting tools, but if there are special tools to be used, such as jigs or fixtures, uh, or if there's really special measuring tools, it's okay to note them in this column. The last column has to do with RPMs and feeds and a little bit more. So this is where you're going to put down the RPMs and feeds for the operations and tooling that you've previously listed. But it's also a good place to write down all the calculations or the results of those calculations that are required for things that do not appear on the print, such as the dimensions over the wires for a thread measurement or the angle for setting a taper attachment or whatnot. This is a very important column because you want to perform all these calculations ahead of time because doing them willy-nilly as you're producing the part really wastes time. So if you want to be efficient, perform all your calculations before you get to the machine and start cutting. And if the project has many operations, well, you may want to use more than one sheet. The subsequent sheets look like this. They're the same, it's just that the header is simplified even more. And, well, here's an example of what the sheet could look like filled out for the hammer handle project. And, well, that's what we're going to be looking at in part three of this video. So, until then, have fun, be safe, and happy machining.